Ken Dryden. Hello, sir. Sure, it's good Come to on. see you. Thank you. Welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you. How are you? Hi. I'm just fine, thanks. Yeah? Yeah. Life is good? Life is quite okay, thanks. Did you do this book to add, add to it? The 30th <laughs> anniversary of the game, that's got to be an interesting experience for a guy like you. It was, actually. Um, I had to read it, and, and I hadn't read it since I wrote it. And, uh, and that was an experience. Yeah. Um, and I needed to read it because I was writing a new last chapter to it. Right. And I, I needed to know what the feel of the rest of it was. And uh, actually, it was, it was fun to re-inhabit uh, Scotty Bowman and Guy Lafleur and, and, and the 1970s of Montreal and Quebec and all that was happening then. It was, right. it was, it was fun. It must have also been really fun to kind of re-inhabit. <laughs> there are Habs fans among us, yes. you know. It <laughs> must have been fun to re-inhabit you in that time. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess. Um, um, I, I try not to re-inhabit myself. Um, it's much more fun to try to inhabit something new and something next. Um, but it was interesting. I mean, it, it really was almost reading a different experience from a different person. And uh, um, I, I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to. I, th I thought I wouldn't like it. And that's why I never read it during all that time. But I actually liked it OK. <laughs> <laughs> Memory is a funny thing, because we don't always remember things the way we yeah. remembered them before. Yeah. No, it, it's true. And, and, and I mean, I have such a stake in that book. I mean, I, uh, it wasn't easy to do. Uh, and in the end, I loved doing it. And the experience from it has been such a surprise all the way along, and of where it it did very well. It had a few other editions that came out. There was a 20th anniversary hardcover edition. Um, and, uh, and so it's something that matters to me a lot. And what would have been really bad is if I had gone back and reread it and not liked it. Right. That would not have been good. Not at all. No. It's interesting that athletes put out books quite often now. Former athletes put out books quite often. But very rarely does that happen where a book like this comes out. You are fresh from playing, right. and it's the philosopher's approach to a game. Yeah. I was thinking after re I read the book when I was young, and I thought, oh, I can't wait for the next person to write that book, the next athlete. It doesn't happen. No. <laughs> Why doesn't it happen? Um, I think mostly because it's hard to do. I mean, you, it, it's not that hard to do with a ghostwriter. Right. It's, it's difficult to do if you do it by yourself. You didn't have a ghostwriter? No, I, I, I wrote it myself. And, and I had to learn how to write a book as I was writing it. And, and it took me two and a half years to write. Uh, and, and there are not very many former players that want to spend two and a half years doing something. Uh, that you want to do it much more quickly. Uh, you're probably into a lifestyle that, uh, that, I mean, you know, books, no matter how many you sell, you don't make a lot of money at it. And so I think, and, and, and plus it's, you know, that we learn how to do something. If we're lucky, we learn how to do it well. If you learn how to do it well, you want to do the next thing well, and, and you want to probably continue doing what you already do well and not take up something that you might not at all. Right. And so it's, it's, a, bit of a, it, it's a bit of a risk to actually, you know, to spend that much time at Did it. Did you think you were going to be good at it? Um, no, uh, but but one of the things that that and and I it was a lesson I learned along along the way through it and other things is, is that I stay at something unless uh, until it turns out. The problem is is that sometimes it might not turn out, mm -hmm. and then you stay at something where in fact the message is this really isn't for you. You really should be doing something else, and and while. You know that 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 approach can be very constructive. It it can also not work at times. I'm sure you've experienced that. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I I, I think like for actually writing, for instance. I mean, I I thought after I started into doing this book that one it would be the only book that I would ever do, uh, and that was almost what I promised myself while I was doing it, and promised our family <laughs> while I was doing it. 
But then after it's done, it's, you know, actually, this is kind of interesting. And then I thought what I, would, I wanted to do is to be uh, like Tracy Kidder or somebody where you come out with a really interesting um, uh, non-fiction book every couple of years. You live the experience for a year, you write it for two years, and then you go on to another really interesting experience and do that as your career. And I did that for a while. And then I thought, um, I'm not sure that I'm good enough um, at it. And, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I decided not to do that and, and, to, and to do other things. I think actually, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm back writing more and, uh, and I, like, I, I like doing it the way I'm doing it now. There's lots of stuff that you've written that we can talk about, but I think it goes back, to, obviously, to your childhood. Here's a, and when you say this stuff, it reminds me of something that I heard after the fact your dad said. Watch this clip here. I would have to say that uh, one of uh, Ken's attributes is his analytical mind. He just <laughs> will not accept things. He, uh, he wants to know why or where, and... Uh, I tell you, uh, as far as our family is concerned, uh, we haven't won an argument since he was about age 15. <laughs> oh my God, I, I don't think I've ever seen that. Is that incredible? Mm. Bad mustache. <laughs> that was he, a great mustache, what are you talking about? He, he, had that, he had that mustache forever. Did he? Oh, geez. So you were always that kid though, trying to figure things out? I guess so, I mean it's... Uh, it's fun to try to figure things out. I mean, there's, you know, there's always a reason why something is. Mm -hmm. And so, what is it? And it, may, and it may not seem to make any sense at all, but if you, if you get at it, and one of the things that took a long time to learn is that everybody makes sense to themselves. And, uh, and it's your job to figure out what their sense is, uh, not to try to assume that their sense is your sense. And you'll, you almost always get it wrong if you try to sort them out from inside you. If you become that other person, then all of a sudden, you know, things fall into place. And so, and that's what a goalie is too. I mean, you know, that it's your job to kind of figure out the game and then get ahead of it, you know, and, and, uh, um, and, and that's what, you know, to me, writing books is the same thing, is just trying to figure stuff out. And, and that's the fun of it, is that you start not knowing. I mean, you know something, but there's a lot that you don't know, and you've got to try to find a way of getting at those things that you don't know, and that makes the writing experience different every day. So well, that's the fun part. Could you have applied all that? So you've had very different careers, but that then in hockey management, where maybe on the ice it didn't go the way you wanted to, but certainly I think a lot of corporate things you did were incredible. You, you tackled the sex abusing exactly the way it should have been done with the, with the Maple Leafs. And then into politics, have you been able to apply that stuff mm -hmm. that you're talking about to both those areas, and has it given you the similar? Yeah, yeah, no, it's just, it, I, I mean, it, you know, the, you can only apply what you are, and, and that's what I am, and, and so that's how I played hockey, that's how I wrote books, that's how I was when I was with the Leafs, and that's, the, you know, Still the same in politics. You say that. Whenever I hear, say, I, I was know, with I the Leafs, it's just like, I oh. I, I, I tend to think of that you period know. that you were vacationing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and uh, we used to beat the Canadians more often than the Canadians beat the Leafs at that time. Uh. But anyway, we'll, we'll Why did go you beyond that. Why have to use that. we that way? No, I know. But you, you, be, you know, again, you become. Yeah. I mean, that was that was the part that I think there are a lot of Leaf fans who couldn't understand it, as well as Canadians fans. Um, but they're the two most similar teams in the league. Yeah, they I have mean, the same fans. Same fans, same degree of commitment, same kind of history, same love, same need, same uh, in, in atmosphere in which you play, um, same demands. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you like one place, you'll like the other. If you don't like it in one of those places, don't bother working in the other because you won't right. like it either. You heard those old stories at Jacques Lemaire when they said, will you come back and coach the Habs? He said, why would I do that to myself? <laughs> like, why would I? Did you have the experience well, with the Leafs? <laughs> um, no, because I like, I mean, I, I like that. I, I mean, I, I understand the experience of not wanting to be uh, in a place where everything that you do is visible and, 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 and before Scotty Bowman has a chance to tell you how bad you were last night, 50 people that you've walked by on the sidewalk, you know, have said the same thing. So it's, you know, that there are a lot of people that find it much easier to just, you know, you've got your paycheck. It's the same amount in Montreal as it would be in St. Louis. Yeah. 
Why not play in St. Louis? You get the attention when you play. As soon as the game is over, you disappear until the next game. Right. It's a nice life, but it's also a diminished life. I mean, that, that if, if you're going to do something, why not do it where it matters? Why not do it where it matters the most? The, the, the penalties are the worst. But the, you know, but the opportunities are by far the worst, too. I mean, yeah. There's nothing like winning in one of these environments. It must have been fun for you to get back to hockey. Um, it was in, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, it, it, I mean it, but it, it, it's also, um, it, it's, it's not as if I was getting back to something. The, the, the off-ice experience is not the on-ice experience. And there's nothing more intimate and intense than the on-ice experience. I mean, you can feel it to some extent off-ice, but it's not the same on the ice. I mean, I, I had that, I, I learned that um, in a very difficult way. When I, I stopped playing with the Canadians in 1979, I was taking my bar exams the next year in, in a course in Ottawa, and I also did the 1980 Olympics for ABC. And, um, and so watching the U.S. team win, and we were about as close to the U.S. team as anybody could be and not be a player. Mm -hmm. And I remember the incredible excitement after they beat the Soviet team and then after they beat the Finns to win the gold medal. And everybody was celebrating like crazy. And about 30 seconds after it was over, I had this sort of deep feeling in my stomach and realizing I'm never going to have the same feeling again that I had as a player. No matter how close I am to this right. team, you know, you're up in the press box or you're behind the bench, you know, you're not on the ice and it doesn't feel the same. You could have been an active player at that time and for many years into the 80s. Maybe, yeah, I, I mean, yes, I, I probably so. Um, it felt as if the best was over um, and... Uh, well, when you left for the Habs, it certainly was the best was over. <laughs> Well, but 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 it, it it was feeling that way the last year. So you we, knew we, that set. I, 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 you, you don't know it, but you feel it a bit, and and uh, and I wasn't enjoying it as as much. And I thought that okay, you everybody has and in, in anything, whether it's in sports or in any other occupation, you have kind of mid-career lulls at a certain point, and 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 that if you can find your way through those lulls then you can have great years at the end of a career as well. And usually in hockey, those lulls happen at 28, 29, 30, when you're saying, why am I doing this? You know, this is too much. I've got my money. I've got everything else. I'm going to leave. I'm going to do something else. You work your way through it, and then why am I doing it? I love it. I'm good at it. Let's keep at it. I'll do it until I die. Uh, but you've got to get through those couple of years, and those couple of years, usually, you fall off a bit. It's not so much fun. The team may not want you anymore. You're not so central to it anymore, and it doesn't feel so good you know, to, to play that lesser role. And, and I, I knew that if I could get through that, I would be able to continue to play. But, but I wanted to do other things, and, and that I knew I had another 30 years of work life ahead of me. Right. I wanted to do something interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the Miracle on Ice moment, because it's one of the most famous calls in sports history, but you have to listen really closely. Yes, yeah, you do. Listen right at the end. You're going to hear somebody <laughs> else's voice. Watch this. <laughs> now Johnson, 19 seconds. Johnson over to Ramsey. Do you let them off? Gets checked by Ramsey. McClanahan is there. The puck is still loose. 11 seconds. You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. Morrow up to Schultz. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Unbelievable. <laughs> so there's a couple moments there. <laughs> yeah. So what do we... Well, well, the classic, you know, is, is that, I mean, that that our kids, you know, when they got to be old enough and to hear that, I mean, that eventually one of them said, Al Michaels came up with, do you believe in miracles? Yes. You came up with unbelievable. <laughs> How come he came up with that and you came up with what you did? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then years later, when the movie was made, yeah. of course, we had to revoice all of that because they weren't using live footage in it. So we're recreating the, the voices. I've got my script. At the end of it, it doesn't have unbelievable. And I say to them, please, 
I said, unbelievable. <laughs> and they said, well, we cut it out. Well, you know, actually it matters to me. Uh, and it really matters to me because there's kind of a family thing about it. It matters to me. And they said, okay, go ahead, voice it. And they still cut it. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, that launched a career of words and writing and speech giving where they couldn't cut you out anymore. Well, yeah, somehow they do, though. <laughs> they yeah. sure found a way. Um, what do you do when you're the best at something, as you were with the Habs? You didn't play there that long, and you won a lot of cups. So there was a lot of championship in your life. And then you get into, you know, the Leafs, there was a turnaround, but there wasn't a championship. And in politics, there wasn't a championship. What, were you good at that part? Um, you just do it. I mean, and, and you do it with the same approach. And you decide that, that a championship is at stake and that you just, and you do it as best you can. And, and that's, I mean, in, in, when I was with the, with the Leafs, um, you know, the Leafs had not had a lot of good years in the previous 25 or so. And, and yet, you know, that, that, that what the Leafs had to understand and it was that they had the chance to be the most important hockey franchise in the world. That was at a time when the dollar was, was struggling, the Canadians were struggling a bit with, with that and trying to afford a competitive team in a non-cap league. And so the Leafs had all of those possibilities and it was fun to try to help people understand this is what it's about. It's about that on the ice, it's about that off the ice. What would the most important franchise in the world do in this way, that way, and the other? It was fun. Yeah. When I was a, a member of parliament and when we were the government, I enjoyed a lot being the government. Uh, I was a minister of social development and, and my principal area of focus, I mean, it was seniors, people with disabilities, but it was also childcare. And I thought, I mean, I had the best job within our government at that time, and it was a tough time because it was 18 months, Gomery was going on, the screaming, the noise, it was almost impossible. You said here once, question period is the pits. Well, it, it is, but it was, it was as if it was question period everywhere, you know, during that 18 months. But what I had, and I was lucky, is that I had a task. I had a, you know, I could take it on as a mission. And, and, you know, this matters, let's find a way. If you can, you know, create it, then it can last forever, all of those things. And I love doing it. I mean, that was really a lot of fun. Once you're in opposition, you can, you, know, you, you can think about the future, you can imagine what you do as the government, you can pretend that you're being constructive and being critical of the government, but it doesn't feel the same. No. Can you have any effect? Yeah, and, and, and you pretend you can, and in some ways you can, but it's mostly a negative effect. I mean, really, like, the, you know, the thing that always stunned me in politics, and it's the same line that's used in sports, is that, you know, is, is that, that, you know, the champion is never defeated, the champion defeats himself. In politics, the government, you know, isn't defeated, the government defeats itself. And that's true in both cases if you add the word ultimately. Right. Ultimately, every government will defeat itself. Every team will defeat itself. The challenge of when you're in opposition or when you're not the champion is to defeat the champion or the government ahead of that time. How do you do it? You don't do it by just helping the government defeat itself. You try to be constructive in terms of what it is you are. What's your story? How do you understand the country? What is it about the country that's special? What would you do as a government? And you don't get a lot of chances to do that. It's mostly, you know, in terms of, of, of speeding the departure of the existing government. And then, it, and then it just gets snide and unpleasant and un uninteresting, actually. Right. Well, so when voters hear that, and you're a voter as well, but when we hear that, we think the system sucks, and it's, or, or at the very least, it doesn't represent us because the, the, in paper, and you know this, the beautiful part of our parliament is that if they worked together, mm -hmm. all sides are represented in some capacity, mm -hmm. but we don't see that really. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it happens in some of mm -hmm. our committees, but mm -hmm. we don't see it, so it yeah. fails us. But you don't work, you know, in, in politics, you don't work together. You know, that there's only one government. And, and really, it's the job of the other parties, even though you might put it differently, is to make you know, that government look as bad as possible uh, and potentially then for you to start to look better. I mean, outside of Ottawa, 
Politics is great. I mean, that, that representing a riding, yeah. uh, you know, actually being around, I mean, your, your job description is to, uh, to improve things for people. That's a pretty good job description. <laughs> you don't get that chance very often. And you can actually do that. And that is a, is a wonderful thing. Um, you know, the rest of it, and I think it, it's why, just as you said, I mean, people end up turning away from politics because they, they don't see the constructive part of it. They see question period, they see scrums, they can't see themselves in it, and they can't see um, the, the seriousness with which they think it should be functioning. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I think you know, that that's part of the challenge right, right now is that, is that what, how can politics function in a way, in fact, that, that, that people in watching it can find it interesting, can find it compelling, can start to see themselves in it, can see it as worthwhile, can see it as worthy of their attention. And right now, politics in the way in which we present it doesn't deliver to that. Aren't you more surprised? I mean, I'm, I don't know. But are you more surprised that people don't see the like? I mean, the voter, because I'm, you know, I, I'm a little bit too black and white on the issues sometimes, where people go, politicians have to engage the people. But I'm like, nah, man, politicians will get away with whatever they're going to get away with. The people have to be engaged to keep them honest. Mm. I mean, what the, 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 the hardest part? And this is, you know, I mean, this is. I mean, I'm not in politics now, but I'm doing things that I hope relate to politics. I think the biggest challenge that, that, that we have has to do with sort of the absence of not only a public conversation and, and a big public conversation, but even what seems like the possibility of it. I mean, the two places in which those conversations one assumes would, ex would exist are politics and media. And in both instances, we are so far away from that happening. Agreed. And, and, but if you can imagine, you know, sort of a Saturday night dinner party and where, in fact, it, it's a real conversation. Nobody arrives knowing everything. Everybody may know a little bit and may discover that they know more than they thought they knew. And you puzzle around and puzzle through and puzzle towards something. And, and how that feels and, and how useful it can be. Politics has got to find its way to where that's possible. I, I, I teach a course now for the last three years at McGill called Making the Future. And this year I'm doing it at the University of Calgary as well. And, it, and it's really all about that. I mean, how do you make a future? How do these students who have 60 plus years of their lives ahead of them and 40 plus years of work life ahead of them, how do they make the future that they would like to make for themselves, that they would like to um, have, um, to live within, 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 their, within their country? And, and one of the, and, and I say to them, you know, don't just give me a vision. Visions are a dime a dozen, they're really easy. How would you get from here to where you would like to be? And, and invariably, what it requires, of course, is, well, other people need to kind of feel the same way. We need to connect. We need to, you know, and we need that kind of public discourse. Where does any kind of public interaction happen now? I mean, it really happens on the internet, yeah. often in really destructive ways, sometimes in quite interesting ways. And I think it's essentially people that have given up on the traditional ways in which that discourse happens. So you must have had some of these opinions when you walked into the House of Commons, and I'm sure you tried to have exert some leverage in the House of Commons to get people to see your way, mm -hmm. and you would have quickly realized, wow, this is tougher to land. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I, I think that there are a lot of people with, that would feel the same way, uh, but, you know, it, and, and it would have been probably the last couple of years that I was really focusing on it. Before that, you know, when, we're, when you're the government, I mean, you're, you're trying to implement it that way, but you're, you know, you're really busy in the implementation. And, and really, it was the last couple of years when I thought, you know, if we're back in, in government, we would like to think that we would be a better government, and maybe we would be, but we wouldn't be as good as what what the country really should have as its government. And, and that, and that what, what we've gotten really wrong is that, is that we don't understand well enough 
what this country really is at this point. You know, we're still imagining Canada as in 1980, 1950, the typically Canadian A stuff that, that, that we aren't any longer. I mean, that, that, that the, you know, the assumption that somehow we don't quite make it at the end and it's inevitable and it's destiny and too bad and all the rest of it. No, that's not Canada in 2014. And I mean, you know, we we got the you know the, the, a nice easy example is you know in a, in a few days it's going to be the Olympics. Remember in, in Vancouver and that debate over own the podium. Oh gosh, we can't say own the podium. That would be too you know too much bragging. That will come home and haunt us. And when we didn't win the first few days, it seemed as if that was exactly it. Yeah. Except who didn't believe it? The athletes. They knew. They knew how good they were. They knew they'd been competing in the world. They, they, they know what the world is about. They know what they're about. They know they're good enough. Right. And, 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 and that, I think, is, is our biggest challenge. And, and, it, and it's that kind of understanding that ultimately ends up forcing politics to be better. You know, that, that, that if we understand that politics can be better, should be better, then we start insisting that it be better. I wish. Stick around. More with Ken Dryden right after this. <laughs> <laughs>I'm teaching George. Yeah, I know. I, I can't. I can't. I can't play hooky. But what I love though is you, <laughs> you taught in McGill, and now you're teaching in Alberta, and I'm sure that that's not lost on you. No, it's it's like I mean the thing that again with the subject matter of of making the future um, is that it, it it's a it's a it's a subject that is a forever subject in Quebec, and it is a necessary subject in Alberta. I mean, you know, here you have a place that has all of these resources that in its uh, 109 years of existence has had, uh, you know, very little population at times, very rural, and now, you know, has this capacity to be what? I mean, th the capacity is there, and it's that question of what is it that we actually want to be? What should Alberta be in 2050 and the rest of it? So it's fun, you know, yeah. in that way. And, and I, I, you know, uh, in two weeks or, well, you know, soon, uh, uh, for the Alberta theme in it, Preston Manning is going to talk to the class. And, and again, about the, the present of Alberta, the past of Alberta, and that future of Alberta, who I wanted for Quebec, and it didn't turn out, uh, but I'm really sad it would have been perfect, was Lucien Bouchard. Yeah. And he wasn't able to do it. And to have, you know, Preston Manning on Alberta, Lucien Bouchard in Quebec, right. that would have been interesting. The conversation about regionalism is, is as old as this country is, and it's still a pretty young country. And in a lot of ways, Alberta is Quebec in terms of its place in Canada. Mm -hmm. Do you see a hopeful future for this country? I mean, not oh. with your, your heart, with your head. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, and... and, and First of all, yes, for sure. I mean, that, that, you know, that, that all that we have in our hands, I mean, you know, that b beyond the, you know, the scale of the country and the 34 million people and all the rest of it, I mean, most particularly, um, 
you know, the, the, what we have done here, and, and it's, you know, we haven't been perfect at it and we beat ourselves up about it, is that we have dealt with diversity here better than anybody else has in the world. Maybe in history. I, th I think so. And, and that is the direction in which the future is moving. You know, we are living in each other's backyards. We cannot separate ourselves from people who are different. Um, we've got to find a way of, of, of overcoming, uh, you know, the, the obsession, you know, with difference and, 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 and of what difference has meant in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and we do it pretty well. And that is, you know, that more than anything, is, is the direction in which that, that, that future is going. And, and all, again, all you need to do is also talk to you know, students. I mean, students, the first thing that they'll do is, is uh, I don't know, you know, I'm 20 years old, I should know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm gonna do, uh, you know, what's my future? That's what they'll say first. Then ask them as I, you know, I, I do at the start of each year is, write me a day in your life 10 years from now. Just one page, that's all. Just tell me your life 10 years from now. It's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so interesting. And where they are, what they're doing, what they're valuing, whether they're married or they're not, what kind of job they're doing, uh, you know, the little details of, you know, I've got a dog, uh, you know, or, or whatever it is. And they are optimistic. Are we preparing our kids properly for university? Oh, that's, you know, that's a bigger question. Um, and I, I mean, I think, you know, that our education system is still uh, much better than almost anywhere, you know, is in the world. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, I mean, one of the challenges we have, and re really, is that, is that now the significant majority of students go on to college or university. You know, 30 or 40 years ago, the significant majority didn't. Are, are you know, are those 30 percent or so that weren't that now are? Are they that much smarter than those kids were 30 or 40 years ago, or are they kind of moved on? You know, in a certain way, but we still use the same structure of universities of lecture and the rest. Well, if you're not a great student, and you're in you know in the invisibility of a large lecture you can get lost pretty quickly and not do all that well. So I, I'm not sure that we have adapted how we deliver to the greater number of students that we are moving on into higher education. Let's go back to Sochi for a second. The last time a Hab goaltender had to star in Russia it was you. And now Carey Price is going to face that. Yeah. I think he'll face it. I, he, if he gets that, started. Yeah, yeah. and I think, he, I think he probably will. I mean, he's, he's good and, and I mean, he, there are a lot of Carey Price critics. Um, Carey Price, what I, what I find really interesting about him is that he started in Montreal spectacularly, then he flattened out and maybe went down a bit for a while, and, um, and then has had to find his way back. It is not easy in Montreal to peak and then drop and to survive, the, to survive Montreal. At that, that moment of the drop, Everybody is on you, and that feels like the world is on you, and you start to say to yourself, why am I here? Who needs this? I've got a whole career ahead of me. This isn't fun. I want out of here. He could very easily have said that. Yeah. He didn't. And he didn't, and he survived that experience. If you can survive that in Montreal, you're a pretty tough-minded person, and a pretty tough-minded person is what you need on, I hope, February the 23rd, when it is a Canada-Russia final. Ooh. That would be perfect. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I was saying to Henderson that he always said that the goal he scored in the game before was the prettiest goal. Mm -hmm. And I had said to him, I thought the goal he scored, the big goal, was a better goal because it was a more Canadian goal because it was a bit stumbly and almost every player on the ice played a role. <laughs> like it was a dive and fall and we willed that puck in the net. Well, when that puck went in with 34 seconds to go, it was awfully pretty. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> the rest of it, I didn't notice. Speaking of the Habs, <laughs> I told the Habs you were coming in and went to visit them. One-on-one -on -one is a breakaway. You got Ken Dryden in net. 
What's your move? Ooh, probably panicking. Ken Dryden now, right? Yeah, Not yeah. Ken Dryden uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> That's right. I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't even shoot on him. I'd dump it in the corner and start, start cycling. Could I score on him? Yeah. I don't know, man. Uh, end up running him over somehow and get a penalty. <laughs> oh, boy. I have no idea. Close my eyes and shoot. I never got to watch him play, but... I don't know, with these new Kevlar sticks, man, it might be tough with, like, no helmet and, like, the gloves and stuff that they use. So, like, sorry, Ken, like, if I, if I said I would score on you, it wouldn't be because you're not good. It's just probably the equipment's just not up to date. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I mean, interesting that, that it would be PK or Subban that would say that. Yeah. And, of course, he's right. I mean, that if, that if he came in it would be far harder for me to stop him than it would be for him to score. Right. And, and, and good for him as somebody who, is, who has a superstar's ability to also have a, a superstar's attitude. Um, I'm and, glad you uh, said that because I'm, I'm sort of tired of all the criticism of players, and PK gets it I think partly because of the fact that he's black, but partly because he's just an outrageous personality. Why don't we want guys like that? We want these guys, don't we? Right. I think so. I mean, I think that, that the thing that's, that's terrific about a player like him or like Carey Price is they really can do special stuff. I mean, you know, that, that all of us like to think we can do special stuff, and occasionally we can, um, but not that often. And, and he can. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and what he, you know, what he has to learn, and he's learning it, is, is just to put that a little bit under control. Um, and, and I remember watching him, and it was a playoff series three or four years ago, just when he started. And it was the final game, and I can't remember, in the, in the playoffs. And by this point, the Canadians were just dead. I mean, they, they, they were not going to win. Nothing was working. And they played Subban, and he had a horrible night. Just about everything went wrong. But what was really nice to see was he tried to do stuff that nothing was happening. Nothing was going to happen. If he didn't try to do something, it would have been a very nice, cozy, easy drift into nothingness and, and a, a definite loss. He tried, he couldn't do it, it backfired, all the rest of it. But the instinct was the right instinct at that particular moment. Right, we're gonna go through the photo album with Ken Dryden right after this. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. All right, get back here with Ken Dryden. I would like to begin by opening up the yearbook of Ken Dryden. Um, there's a cute little picture of you here, yeah, but I'm sure. <laughs> there's a, a great moment here. Where's the page this is mark? It's Etobicoke Collegiate. Etobicoke. There's your yearbook. The Etobian. The Etobian. Yeah, right. And it talked about what you were going to be, and it said oh, that Ken Dryden sense. loves hockey, future occupation, net mender. <laughs> That's your, do you remember your high school days fondly? I do, actually. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, um, I mean, there was no high school hockey at the time, yeah. uh, but I played basketball, and I loved playing basketball for the high school. And it yeah. was just, yeah, I, I really. And we had we were a class that stayed together all the way through, and it was a good group. Big part of your story is you could just as easily have been a Boston Bruin. We're thankful you weren't, yeah. but that would have been proof as a little kid. Yeah. Well, this is, this is actually a terrific picture because this was just after we moved into our new house. Yeah. And I would have been six years old and our, our parents did the unimaginable. They paved our backyard so that all of the neighborhood ball hockey games could happen in Dryden's backyard. Nice. And it is my favorite place of childhood. And we had nets made. And, and I still have one of those nets, and my brother has the other. That's awesome. And when we had, when I had my day with the cup, finally, a couple of years ago, we had a ball hockey game in our backyard because the pavement had not been torn up. Right. And at one end was one of those original nets, and at the other end was a net from the final game of the Montreal Forum. Oh. And that was the final ball hockey game. That was, property is a special fun. property now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a, my, our, our parents started a, a, a charity, you know, while, uh, I mean, and, and it, just, it, it just grew and it took over the house. And eventually it 
did take over the house, and now nobody lives in it, but it's uh, the, you know, the charity that they started that functions out of there. Oh, brother, well, uh, yeah, that's my dad and brother and uh, a friend of my brother's named John Baird, mm -hmm. and uh, my dad always John had... John Baird? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad, my dad was this, a, a brick and block salesman, and and he loved to sell. And every year he would he would say, "You got to have a distinctive car." Well, because that's not the stripe on the car. That was the stripe on the car. He would always have a, a double blue Ford, and not just the blue roof, but he'd have a blue flash down the side. <laughs> that was my dad. Learn how to stand out. <laughs> um, I, I'm a big fan Gosh. of this one here. Wow. Oh, geez. Yeah, this is uh, my brother and I in, in goal. The United and, Church uh, Observer. Yeah, and, and what's really interesting, and my brother and I think is really funny, our sister doesn't, is that my... That's right, exactly. Here is the picture, but with my sister over here. <laughs> now, 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 the United Church Observer, we eventually got the photo, yeah. and it has the photo editor's comments on it, and what it says is that there's a little, it was the preview, or like it was just written on it, and just said, please crop little girl. <laughs> and, and we discovered it years later, and we gave it to our sister a year ago for Christmas and had it all, all, all framed and everything. Just please crop Why? little girl. <laughs> now, you know who we got that photo off? We should thank this guy uh, for the photo because this is the guy that gave us all the pictures right here. We'll bring him up. That guy. Oh, my Your brother, brother gave us yeah, those photos. Yeah. Well, he was a terrific guy. And, um, uh, I mean, he's... Um, as good a big brother as, as you get. He was terrific. And that was the, um, um, after the first game, it was, I think it was my, my, my second game in Montreal, just as I started, and it was the first time that brothers as goalies had played against each other, mm -hmm. and it's still the only time. The only time. Yeah. That's gotta be a really special And our dad was in the crowd. It's about 10 years since your father passed, roughly. Mm -hmm. What do you remember of him? Um, I mean, he was just, uh, he's a guy who just loved to, to do stuff. I mean, he, and, and, and uh, you know, he, he liked to do things that felt like they mattered and, and uh, um, um, you know, and, 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 and you know, that whatever, whatever he did, he believed in. I mean, he, he believed in the companies that he sold bricks and blocks for. He believed in Etobicoke. I mean, Etobicoke after you know, World War II and the building of the suburb and new schools and new playgrounds, what could be better? You know, he believed, whatever it was that he did, he believed in. Um, and eventually, you know, with the charity that he started, he believed in that. Two-tone Ford, what would he have made of Ford Nation? <laughs> <laughs> Which is Etobicoke now. Yeah, I know. Well, he would have... Um, he, yeah, he would have had a hard time, you know, with it. He would, he would have just sort of thought, that's just not right, you know, he'd, he'd something like that. What would you feel about it? Um, well, I, I mean, the thing, that, the thing that's the hardest for me is that, is that Toronto, you know, even as people in other parts of the country and how they think, Toronto is an important place. It, it's a place that matters. It's a place that matters to Canada. Um, Canada does better if Toronto is doing better, just as it does better if Vancouver is Montreal and, and, and other places. And, and, and Toronto has lots of really special qualities about it. And, um, um, and, and at the very least, what this time is, is, is that it's, it's a bit of a wasted opportunity. It's a bit of a wasted time. Uh, when, when Toronto could be, you know, getting about being what Toronto is. Mayor Ken Dryden ever? No, I'm, I, I like what I'm doing. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I hope to do public stuff. But, the 30th know. anniversary of the game, one of the greatest, if not the greatest sports we've ever written. We'll be right back. Thanks, Ken.